I'm going to start off today's episode with an excerpt from a 2005 HBO magazine article entitled Back Where We Belong by today's guest. It starts as follows. For most of my 25 years at Pitney Bowes, the threat of obsolescence has hung over us. We are, after all, in a business that is deeply associated with what commentators are inappropriately referred to as snail mail. Our genesis was the postage meter, and still 85 years after Arthur Pitney and Walter Bowes brought it to market, more effective processing of physical mail is at the core of our business. To use the most ominous metaphor, we are the buggy whip to the postal service's buggy. The question constantly arises in a world increasingly transformed by email and other electronic communications, is our business destined to go the way of Pony Express? Perhaps it's no surprise then that as chairman and CEO, I spend a large proportion of my time, about 25% on strategy. Speculation about our future enters into every discussion with every investor. It factors into customers' decisions on investing in capital equipment and potential employees pose questions about it when they're considering joining us. I have to arrive at answers that I can put forward convincingly and with conviction, even if they clash with many people's assumptions. The point of this article and today's episode is not to sell you on the Pitney Bowes strategy at the time, though our guest hopes it will help us see its wisdom. Rather, as it is today for this episode, it's to put you in the shoes of someone who has a big bet strategy to sell every single day. It's a pleasure to welcome that person, the author of that article back in 2005, and for part two, after a stellar part one, former CEO and chairman of Pitney Bowes, Michael J. Cortelli. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Aiden. I really am honored to be back on the program. Mike, it's great learning from you. I absolutely loved part one. I edited it especially before today's episode, so I had the full context of that episode. And then you brought me down many more rabbit holes with so much more of your content on your website that I'll link to. But also this article, I thought it was so brilliant to step back into your shoes two decades ago when you wrote it. And I thought we'd help set the scene. I was going to read out a small excerpt here for you to fill in the gaps and bring us back, paint the picture for us. You start off here telling us that as early as the 1960s, the company began thinking that its future strength lay in broad diversification. By the end of the century, you had taken at least six different tracks, moving into ventures as disparate as non-core capital equipment leasing, mortgage servicing, and retail supply chain systems. Now you've shed those plans and are recommitted to your core business of helping companies manage their mail and documents more effectively. You think there's plenty of opportunity to grow that core, particularly in global markets, and to move into adjacent lucrative market spaces. You also believed at the time that working collaboratively with other stakeholders in your industry, including postal services, you then could create more profitable growth opportunities. So that's a little bit of scene setting, but I'd love you to paint the picture more adequately and bring us back to where you were. Well, thank you. I think the most important insight that I got came very early in my Pitney Bowes tenure, and it was the random statements in marketing collateral in which we said, at that time, to send a first-class letter, it costs at one dollar and fifty cents. Now that was the postage was, at that point, probably twenty-five cents. So the rest of it were other tasks associated with sending out a letter, and all the different design and print and finish features. Because the the whole point of that marketing collateral was that letter counted for something. People would receive it, they'd open it, they'd do something relative to it. So what really intrigued me was how was the other dollar twenty-five being spent? We had a very small share of that with the mailing desktop mailing equipment. What other profitable opportunities were there and in that 
$1.25, which by the time I got to the point at which I wrote the article was probably $1.75. And so where could there, where were there profit opportunities? Was it in the accounting for the mail? Was it in the marketing content? Was it in location intelligence to know to whom to mail? So that was the first insight that led me to think about differently about this. The second was that much of mail had consequences beyond the uh, cost of the mail itself. In other words, there were reasons why people needed to get mail out on a given day. They were sending a bill out. They were meeting a compliance requirement from the government. So the impact of the, let's say the letter cost $2.25, but that letter may have had an impact in the several hundred dollars or several thousand dollars. So the question was, what were people doing with what was inside the envelope or inside the package? And the third insight that I got was this idea that you had to teach people the benefits of using physical mail because some people were making a lot more money using it than other people were doing it. And my favorite example of that was something we featured in an annual report from that era. The woman who walked into a non-customer retail outlet, which was a Japanese restaurant, where and the reason she walked in to sell the value of using mail was they were putting little flyers under her door when they were delivering to other apartments in her New York City apartment building. And she went to them and said, why don't you send a letter with promotionals to people who have been to your restaurant to get them to have their neighbors come to the restaurant? And within a few years, not only did they have desktop mailing equipment, they had $250,000 console systems and they were performing this service for other Japanese and Chinese restaurants, and they had opened up a second restaurant. So a lot of what we did was teaching people how to use a communications capability. So I looked at all of that and I said, there's a lot more opportunity than, is, than meets the eye here, which we weren't focused on before the year 2000. We were looking at ways to run away from the market as opposed to saying, where are the profitable opportunities within the market? I love that, Mike, because one of the things you say is understanding the competitive context and how it can be reshaped by your actions was your greatest strategic responsibility. And you said here, if I can bring in different frameworks, new lenses and fresh vocabulary to help spring people from the entrenched mental models, that they may help us to innovate in strategically creative ways. I love that idea of empowering the organization to spot inflection points, weak signals, as we talked about in part one. But one of the ways you put this was, again, mentioning how widely you read, was that you read an article about how Coca-Cola had changed their view of their organization. And they weren't competing with other soft drink companies. Instead, they were competing for share of stomach. I thought you might riff on that a little bit. Yeah, in the mailing business, our biggest op opponent, if you will, was not other postage meter companies or other companies that did high tech mailings or email. It was people doing things manually that could be automated. And a good example of that was when I walked into a the mailroom at St. Jude's, which is a major children's cancer and care and research center in Memphis, Tennessee. And I noticed that somebody was filling out a form and I asked them what they were doing. And they said, we have almost a thousand different clinical studies and we have to record the amount of postage we are using for both outbound and inbound mail because we have to charge the cost of postage to an individual study. There's no overhead that we can just uniformly pass on to all funders. They want every dollar that we spend recorded and documented. So I realized that there was an opportunity for an automated accounting system. And today we would probably do that with a cloud-based system. In those days, we were using a desktop accounting system. 
but it's a use case where the competition, if you want to call it competition, was somebody doing something manually that they really didn't want to do, but uh, had to do to comply with the requirement of those who were funding the clinical studies. And a lot of tasks in the dollar fifty beyond the postage were manual tasks that somebody required somebody else to do. So that was an insight that I had in terms of reframing competition. Similarly, in the production mail end, what we learned from studying voting processes is when we got into the voting by mail business with our ReliaVote product, and I thought about it this morning when I went to vote in a municipal election here in Florida, is that our opposition was not other voting by mail systems, but people using voting machines or people not voting because it was too inconvenient. So we wanted to make voting not only convenient, but highly secure. And unfortunately, in 2020, we went overboard in making voting convenient, but we sacrificed security. And we had in that you have across accusations of voter fraud or voter suppression, both happen. They just happen in different places with different people doing them. And unfortunately for the uh, Trump campaign, I don't think he understood uh, what case to make because he lost every single case. And the, the voting by mail system, Republicans came to realize they had to embrace secure voting by mail rather than fighting it because it is the better way to go for many people. You want to make, you have early voting, you have voting by mail, and then you have voting in person. We chose to vote in person today because it's a municipal election. There aren't a lot of people that are going to wait in line at seven o'clock in the morning for a local election. But when we get to November, we are probably going to do some sort of early voting so we don't have to wait in a 45-minute line at seven o'clock in the morning to vote. But so we recognized that our competition very often was either manual processes or inertia. We'll come back to that, Mike, because this was a huge part of retrenching the organizational mindset and the culture, et cetera, because as you moved more towards a service-based business, that entailed an entire change of how people thought, how they worked out of their silos, less decentralized like they were before. I'd love to come back to that because that is a huge challenge many organizations experience today. But right at the top of this article, you suggested that we should be paranoid about monitoring changes in leadership even in related areas. For example, you mentioned it was really important for you to monitor the governmental postal services around the world, not just in the US, but everywhere, because one change, as we saw during COVID over the far side of the world, could mean an entire tsunami coming your way, your side of the world. I'd love you to share that because you said here, with a few missteps or the wrong leadership at the helm, the fortunes of certain postal services could change dramatically. And because of that, then you would reap the rewards or not, as the case may be. In the United States in the 1990s, the Postal Service went outside to hire Marvin Runyon, who had been a 37-year veteran of Ford Motor Company and eventually became the CEO of the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was a government, a quasi-government corporation. And the problem with certain kinds of governmental entities in the United States, and I can't speak to, although I think there's a similar issue abroad, is that if I'm a leader who wants absolute power and control, these quasi-government organizations are wonderful vehicles for having most of the powers of government, but almost none of its controls. And there was a book written in the 1970s about the most powerful man in New York State, a gentleman named Robert Moses. And the book was called The Power Broker. And he created the concept of an independent entity. And they were created by law. And basically, these were things like the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the Niagara Mohawk Power Authority, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And these had the power to condemn property, to tax people, 
but voters couldn't vote their leadership out of office. The only people they were accountable to were their bondholders and their boards of directors, but they were pretty much independent of control by citizens. So they had lots of power, but very little control over them. And this is dangerous to democracies. The people in government like that because then they can get things done without having to go through the messiness of having to subject themselves to public meetings and all of that. Most of that's changed, obviously, in the last 50 years. But Robert Moses built highways, he built bridges, tunnels. He did the two New York World's Fairs in 1939 and 1964 with almost no interference from the voting public. He built the Cross Bronx Expressway and displaced hundreds of thousands of people with very little ability of those people to stop what he was doing. And the Postal Service hired a guy like that who believed that he could do whatever he wanted, and he played hardball with a lot of external constituencies. What ev- which what eventually got him fired was that the four postal labor unions were more powerful than he was. And they leaked a story to the Washington Post about how he had a small amount of Coca-Cola stock, uh, and Coca-Cola was a vendor to the Postal Service. And the story was on the front page of the paper every day. And then eventually members of the what's called the Government Accountability Office in, in the United States issued an inquiry to the Postal Board of Governors asking about this conflict of interest issue. So Runyon was ushered out the door. But we had a problem in those years because they were basically daring us to sue them because they thought they had absolute power and they were trampling on our rights. We ended up suing them. They thought they were going to win the lawsuit. The judge basically denied their uh, motion to dismiss our lawsuit. And we ended up settling. They paid us uh, $51.7 million as the largest settlement they had ever paid out at that time. And fortunately, by that time, I actually met with Runyon's successors, and it was a wake up call for us. And we said, we can't let somebody take power and ignore those kinds of leaders who think that they don't need us. And unfortunately, that happened in Germany with the guy who ran Deutsche Post for 18 years, and it happened in a few other markets. So I paid a lot of attention to what went on in non-U.S. markets. Uh, The U.K. and France, we ended up having great relationships with them. But Germany was challenging on my watch because the German government allowed this guy to basically raise up the cost of first-class mail. It was the equivalent of 75 U.S. cents, whatever the equivalent rate in euros was. And they were using all this excess money to buy up logistics companies. They bought up DHL. They bought up Airborne. They lost a lot of money in these other businesses. And it was being subsidized by the individual German rate payer. And they basically stole a lot of our good ideas at the time. There was nothing we could do because they were a regulator as well as a competitor. And uh, I sent my board of directors a book called Competing with the Government to make them understand that this was a different environment than dealing with the Securities and Exchange Commission or the FDA or the Federal Trade Commission. These were people that were in our business competing with us while they were regulating us. Now, we stopped that from happening in the U.S. by the 2006 legislation, and I played a very important role in getting that legislation enacted. So it was very important to protect our interests by being active in postal advocacy, something that my successors did not do. That's such an important point, Mike, that's not often made, that idea of competing with different rules. It always reminds me of, if you've seen that movie, The Gladiator, yeah. and he stabs him in the side and then fights him. Like, it's not fair to fight those ways. And as you said, if they're competing and using taxpayer money to compete, then how the heck can you compete with that? Something is said to me before we came on air was the idea of giving the full picture, because when people compare themselves, even as a leader, some leaders will be comparing themselves to you and the decisions you make but it's an entirely different context. I think this is such an important point you made to me before. You cannot compete at that moment in time 
the decisions and the information you had available to you, the playing conditions at the time, the international conditions. I mean, some of the things you were dealing with were just after experiencing the anthrax tainted letters, for example, what will that do to our industry? There was so much coming at you at the same time that you just can't compare yourself to go, I would have done this when I was in his shoes. Yeah, ultimately, every market environment is different. And like you said, if you're going to really learn the lesson and apply the lesson that's put in front of you in a business book, you really have to understand what was going on at that time. You also have to understand what the market situation is. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. One of the common mistakes people make about whether to go into a market is they'll say, is it a big market? Is it an attractive market? And they assume that if you answer those two questions and you say, and can I compete in that market, then let's go into it. What you don't understand is that there is another question you have to ask, which is if everybody considers that market attractive and enters it, then it becomes an unattractive market. And there's an old British economist concept called tragedy of the commons. And the tragedy of the commons is there's a fertile grass field in a town commons. And when too many farmers put their cows in the field or sheep, whatever, the grass gets eaten up and it's no longer attractive. So the ideal market to enter is a market that appears less attractive than it really is, or where you have this unusual competitive advantage that's sustainable that isn't recognized by other people. And it's funny, this is true in a variety of contexts. In the book Zero to One, Peter Thiel writes that one of his interview questions is, what is it that you believe that most other people don't believe? And so the whole point of innovation is to find something where you're looking at it through a lens where other people aren't going to literally follow you into a market and make the market unattractive. And Pitney Bowes had a market with lots of little, seemingly little opportunities that were very profitable niches, but that very few people who didn't understand the market would ever have thought about because you need salespeople who are on the ground, who walk into mail rooms, who see how people are doing things. And that the biggest mistake that I think was made after I retired was they thought of salespeople as people who were selling something that people wanted. We used to say, and I think it was true then, it's still true now, our products are not bought, they're sold. There are a certain number of customers that you can say, these are products that everybody's going to want. So you hire inside salespeople or you have an attractive website. People are going to find you. They're going to do a search and they buy your product. But there are so many other opportunities where you have to alert people to the fact that there is a different way of doing something. And you need somebody who's on the ground in an in-person setting to do that. And that was my definition of what made this market attractive. We we had this large network of human sensors who could contact us and say, like my tech people, you know, we the, the Help America Vote Act gives us an opportunity in places like Palm Beach County to come up with a secure voting by mail solution. And a lot of people are going to want to buy this. But I wasn't thinking about that, but people on my team were thinking about it. And all I had to do was say, go ahead and do it. And there were other things I learned about. I think I might have mentioned somewhere, may or may not, maybe not in that article, that my daughter and I were coming back from a ski trip in Vail, and Pitney Bowes had acquired a company in Boulder on our way to visit my nephew as a surgeon in Denver. And I said, I'd like to visit this. I don't know what they do there. And they had location intelligence software applications. And I saw this as a potential future for the company. And we built that up and eventually acquired MapInfo. And it was a $400 million business. But it was asking, how do you use this stuff? 
And we had customers like Darden Restaurants that used this software to figure out where to locate uh, restaurants like Olive Garden. The post offices were using it abroad to figure out where to put a retail post office. New York City was using it in their comp stat system to figure out where to deploy a foot patrolman and where to have them walk every day on their beats. And I said, this address management is a core capability of Pitney Bowes and the Postal Service. We should be in this business and we should grow this business and it'll survive even if mail volumes decline. But it was a random visit to a $10 million operation in 2005 that caused me to see that. So you got to have whatever expression you use, boots on the ground, feet on the street. And that's how you find these opportunities. And the company we acquired, Group One, had not seen the potential of this business that I saw. But we saw it and we built on it. And unfortunately, after I retired, Pitney Buzz did not continue to invest in it. That's something I'd love to come back to because one of the ways you say you can survive, because disruption comes for everybody, we know that. The innovator's dilemma, you mentioned that in, in part one of this series, also comes for you where you'll be undermined by somebody who will do it cheaper or the internet will change your business model entirely. And one of the ways you can compete and survive, at least if not thrive, is through spend on R&D. That was something you did massively. So I'm going to throw a couple of things and please go wherever you like with this. The first was one of the key things you said there, and I mentioned this in part one, you expanded upon it was that it's not you who determine value, it's the customer. And that was a lesson you learned when you worked in, in, in the law industry, in the yeah. legal industry. And then the other one was you mentioned Steve Blank and Eric Reese in part one, and that concept of get out of the building. And then the third thing I just love you to share was this idea that by getting outside the building, because this is something I've definitely learned from you that you've done consistently, was get out there into the mail rooms and have the sensor turned on. You mentioned that term sensor, have the sensor turned on for senses of change and being able to read what they could possibly mean. Th those things combined create this kind of, I always think of that idea of the bat computer to be able to understand what's going on out there. I learned this lesson from being around sales managers who are really good at their jobs and people who ultimately were elevated to vice presidential positions. And I said, what's the secret of success for the people that are really good at what they do, very good at what they do? And he said, they steal with their eyes, meaning they spot an opportunity. The other thing they do, and this is why we hired and I consented to hiring anthropologists, is it's, the, it's what people don't tell you about what they're doing and don't think to tell you, but what you observe that ultimately are the biggest opportunities. You know, the old Henry Ford expression comes into play when he says, if I asked a hundred consumers what they wanted in 1905, they'd say more reliable, faster horses, as opposed to a motorized vehicle that could replace the horses. So you have to bring a certain kind of intelligence to spotting those inefficiencies and in tasks. And you can only do that by either being there or by talking to people who are in the trenches or on the street or whatever term you want to use. And that's what I did. I, I would just be out there to pick up on those kinds of senses and opportunities that other people weren't picking up on. Mike, one of the things you, you mentioned in this article as well, and this is useful for leaders who go, oh, well, that's well for Cretelli. He had time to do that, but you made time to do that, but you also engaged other people. So you hired a chief strategy officer. You also had Institute for the Future on the books in order to see what was coming down the line. And then you also leaned into the idea of scenario planning. And I thought this was really interesting because these are helpful things for organizations in times of unbelievable change that you have to have more eyes on the ground. Yes, activate people like Mike said, your salespeople, your people out on the ground, the mail rooms, et cetera, but also having people who are dedicated to that is an important step. 
Absolutely. And you need to hire a certain kind of person. You know, it's funny, there are telltale signs that seem very unrelated to what you just said. But what I found when we brought people in to give them international assignments, if they're at a vice presidential level and they expect people to do things for them when they go abroad, they're going to fail. And where they live abroad matters. In other words, if they're going to London or Dublin or wherever, and they're living amongst expatriates, they're going to probably fail. You have to meld in with the local population. Ideally, put your children into the schools that the local people go to. And it's also people's sense of adventure. There were two people I remember, one who I sent to the UK, and he didn't wait for the details to be ironed out. He said, I'm excited about this. I'm going to be on the next flight. My wife and my 13-year-old son are excited about this. And they're really looking forward to the adventure of being in a completely foreign location for them. And then you have somebody who hangs back and negotiates every detail about relocation. And we were sending him to Australia. And he failed miserably in Australia because he never got out. And he tried to apply what he learned in the United States. He thought that what we were sending him to do was to replicate what he had done in the United States. And oddly enough, the most successful international hire I ever did was an American who was not in management in the United States, but had been in sales because he was hands on. He learned to be a manager on the fly, but he used a lot of hands on tactics to adapt to the foreign environment. And he succeeded. The people who were at a higher level that we were training to see if they could move from vice president to president, they had lost the ability to understand how to get the job done if they had to do it themselves. One of the things that I tuned into, it was a very much uh, one-liner within your writing. And I wrote an article on it because I tried to write an article that expresses some of the feelings or the themes from each of the episodes. And this sparked me to write this this article. And it, it's essentially the tyranny of the term, we tried that already. <laughs> and you say you got to consistently revisit assumptions. And I'd love you to share your thoughts on that because it's something you said here that you have to look at what's changed in the world and come back to it on a regular basis. Or as you actually say, you say, it's a question that has to be revisited continually. And that is a huge amount of investment for a leadership team because they like to just put a line through it and feel like they can move on and onto the next of their to-do list, which is never ending for leaders. My favorite example of that, and it was not getting into a new business, but getting into a new country. We tried multiple times to acquire a company in France. It was the only company we theoretically could acquire because it was the only one not competing in the United States. Anybody we wanted to buy who had a U.S. operation, the U.S. Justice Department would not have allowed it. And in 1995, that company was called SACAP, was acquired by a billionaire private equity owner, very interesting, colorful, brilliant leader named Marc de la Charriere. I met him in 1995. He, bought, he had bought SACAP. And he wasn't interested in selling. And by 1997, I'm interested in selling, but my price is going to be 1.5 billion French francs, which at that time was 300 million US dollars. And uh, we valued the company at 1 billion French francs, which was 200 million US dollars. And I would meet with him every year. Uh, he would come to New York or I'd go to Paris. And we'd have a very pleasant dinner. And we were always $100 million apart. And then I noticed a couple things. One was he, was he was very interested as the EU was coming into uh, being as in a bigger way with the common currency, with the euro. He was very interested in redeploying capital to buy companies inside the EU and to pay in euros. The light bulb went on for me, and I said, gee, I wonder if there's a way to do this. 
And I discovered that at that point in time, the French franc was now eight French francs to the dollar. So 1.5 billion French francs was less than $200 million. So we made contact with him again, and we eventually struck a deal at 235 million US dollars because he had improved his company. And it turned out to be one of the best deals we ever did. But I was, I was obsessed with finding a way to do this. And I never let go of the opportunity. I didn't check the box and say, I met with him in 97. It's over. We can't do it. He's, he's rigid. Things changed for him. The currency changed from the French franc to the euro. The euro at that point entered into the market at 0.82 to the dollar. So there were a lot of reasons why circumstances changed. Similarly, we got out of the cigarette tax stamping business in the early 80s. It was a right decision in the US. In 2003, we discovered that that business made sense in Asia where there was a lot of counterfeiting and we're putting stamps with the new metering technology. Digital metering made sense. So we we re-entered the cigarette tax stamping market as well as the broader authentication market in Asia, because as my head of Asia Pacific said, these are low trust societies where there's a lot of counterfeit goods in the market. I always assumed that businesses or opportunities succeed or fail at a point in time. And you have to constantly say what's changed either for good or bad. Brilliant. And, and now they're all ripe for disruption by things like blockchain. So <laughs> the world keeps on, keeps on changing. But there's a, I, I wanted to, Mike has to run to another meeting. So I have a limited time. There was a key change I mentioned at the top of the episode. And it was where you had to retrench culture, how people worked. You had to centralize the organization in a time when it was originally conceived to be a decentralized business, which is so, so difficult to do. And this was when you had to move, as you said, towards a more management service business, which many organizations had to do. And when organizations were built for a specific, essentially silos, they actually become more and more siloed. But then when you have overlap with the customer for each of those silos, the entire organization needs to change. And there's a little quote here that I'll just share with our audience. You said, the unique solutions we have crafted often through heroic entrepreneurial efforts on the part of local site managers simply have not been scalable. As many other companies moving into services have discovered every customer site is unique. But if our professional services business is to be profitable, we must select from among all possible solutions the handful that can be standardized, branded, and sold broadly. That is a huge challenge because firstly, you had rewarded and recognized those entrepreneurial efforts of the local site managers, but then you needed to shift culture and centralize things in a disciplined way, which would be so foreign to entrepreneurial colleagues. I'd love you to share how you manage this because that is a mammoth task. Oh, de very definitely. And it, we set up, when we did acquisitions, and we did about 80 of them, we created an acquisition integration template and an acquisition integration team. And we asked the question, and this was equally true of reintegrating uh, standalone business units, what is it that we must keep in place that is entrepreneurial and why we bought the company and what is it that is not core to that business. So financial, you know, financial back office functions didn't need to be there. We could centralize those. HR, some of the things in HR needed to be decentralized. Others, uh, particularly recruiting, but others needed to be centralized. We went from 25 different benefit packages down to four. And we did the same with policies and procedures like overtime, vacation pay. We recognized 
that there were differences in markets, but not as many differences as people thought in the individual business units. And one of the challenges I had was that um, people would glibly make the statement, oh, if I don't control it, I can't be held accountable. And my answer to that is there are a lot of things that we can't control, even within an individual business. We don't have salespeople say, I can't be held accountable for not getting sales because I don't control what the customer does. If everybody had the attitude of, I've got to control it. And I, I basically said in every job we have, you've got to be able to show the skill of being able to influence others. And if you can't influence and you can't come up with basically reaching the happy medium, you don't belong. And I also pointed out customers look at us as one company. Investors are investing in Pitney Bowes, not because we we're basically an intermediary allocating capital. They believe in our business in certain parts of the business. And one of the things they didn't believe in was our capital services, our, our non-core finance business. They said, if I wanted to invest in a non-core capital services business, I wouldn't invest in Pitney Bowes. I'd go to, you know, one of the financial services firms. So I had to say to people, the customers look at us as one company. Investors look at us as one company. The community looks at the Pitney Bowes logo and name, not Pitney Bowes Mailing or Pitney Bowes Management Services. So that was the biggest challenge on my watch because the prior culture was had moved from highly centralized up through the early to mid-1980s up to highly decentralized from 85 to 95. And during that period, you had group presidents that basically cons- felt like they didn't belong with the rest of the company. It's a huge challenge. And it happened to other companies like W.L. Gore and Son, which were famous for their decentralized nature. But as the world changed, so too does the structure of the organization change. Mike, I have one last question for you. And this is to do with, you mentioned in part one about exiting the external finances business. And this was a point where you weren't able in a decade to be able to attend this board meeting and you expected the board just to tick the box and move on. But in your absence, they resisted. And I thought about this, how important it is. We often talk about it on the show about entering markets, but actually exiting markets or shuttering parts of the organization is a really difficult thing. And if you had any recommendations for leaders or even VCs who listen to the show, what would be your main points? Yeah, first of all, it wasn't a board meeting. It was a board committee meeting. I've never in my life missed a, missed a full board meeting in any company where I was on a board or definitely not as the CEO. This was the finance committee. My advice is that what we ended up doing there was taking a snapshot at as of that point in time then bringing in an investment banker that we weren't using to do the potential divestiture to basically say, if we were going to enter this business today, what kind of cost of capital would our investors or any investors expect in a standalone business? And the term that my Eaton board colleague, John Miller, acquainted me with was risk-adjusted cost of capital. And if you looked at future revenues and profits from this business, you did a discount to the present based on a higher discount rate than the discount rate we used to enter the business, the discount rate we were using in other parts of our business, or the discount rate we'd use with the proceeds for anything else we were going to invest in. So you look at the risk at that point in time, and you get a third party to say, if I were in this business today, what would I do? And Andy Grove talked about that in the book, Only the Paranoid Survive, when he and Gordon Moore met and they were in the memory chips business. And they said, if we were walking into this business today, would we still be in it? Would we want to stay in it? And they said, no, we, we would exit it. So you got to step back and take a fresh look based upon 
a rigorous cost of capital analysis and probably get third party and investor or analyst assistance in doing that. And that's the only way you take the emotion out of it, the, you know, the, the built-in loyalty. You've got to be very cold-blooded about that because I love the people in capital services. They were my favorite, probably my favorite people in the company. They're very entrepreneurial. They, they moved quickly. They were innovative. They did amazing things, but the business ultimately didn't belong inside Pitney Bowes. And we sold it to Cerberus Capital. Absolutely gold, this episode. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you, learning from you. I'm so glad I read about you in Ian Morrison's book, The Second Curve. So glad you had taken on Institute for the Future as well, because all these decisions have led to this moment for me. And it's been an immense learning experience. Mike, where is the best place for people to find you, to learn more about your work, etc.? Either on my own website, MikeRitelli.com, or on LinkedIn. I, just to give you an idea of something I'm interested in, as the president of my condo association, I literally published an article this morning about the issue with the collapse of those towers, that uh, the collapse of a tower in the Miami area in 2021, and what investigators are learning. The other thing to keep in mind is I'm a co-owner of a company called MoveFlux. The website's not going to be terribly revealing, but uh, we are launching some new products. So watch what I'm doing there as well. Any of those sites will give you visibility into what I'm doing. And I published in MoveFlux and its Make Us Well affiliate blogs in the last few years on health-related issues. Also. I have some good news for me. Mike is going to feature in my new book as well. Some of the lessons I've learned from him and that I'm going to infuse into that forthcoming book as well. For now, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Michael J. Cretelli, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And I'm honored to have been here. It was a pleasure for me as well. And good luck to you and your work on the book.